Hey guys, welcome back to Jalen Says. We had some technical difficulties, but we're here with Maceo Brown, a CEO of System 5 Electronics. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. God is good. I, every day I wake up, I give God thanks for the blessings, and uh, it's just a, a marvelous day. I had the chance to uh, see uh, some of the John Lewis uh, 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 things that was going on there, and I, and I felt very inspired, you know, as a young man. So today is a good day. Amen. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about you? Okay. Well, I was born and raised here in Atlanta, Georgia. My mother is uh, originally from Augusta, Georgia, and my father is from Richmond, Virginia. And I'm the youngest of four boys. Uh, I went to Frank L. Stanton uh, Elementary School right here in Southwest Atlanta in the Mosley Park area. And uh, from there I graduated uh, and, and went on to Turner High School. <clears throat> uh, so I had a godfather who's Maceo Newberry. He graduated from Morris Brown College. And uh, I was named after him. So he was more or less my mentor uh, and so uh, he kind of taught me a lot of business sense. And, uh, and from there, I actually started carrying a briefcase to school, believe it or not, in the seventh grade. And people used to kid me about the briefcase because I always said I would become a business owner. And that uh, kind of helped motivate me at that point in time. Uh, because I went to school with a briefcase. Yeah. So, uh, you know, business was... I, I love math. I was I was very good in math, so that was one of my top uh, classes in math. And uh, I like working with my, you know, I learned. Uh, I like I did culinary arts in, in elementary school back then. I did wood tech. I learned how to cut wood. And I learned how even learned how to build a dog house back then. So wow. it was very important of the things that we did as a younger person that they don't do now. Uh, as I've gotten older, I see that the school systems have totally changed. So, so what did you do as a young person when back in your day? Well, you know, uh, you know, I got all the hand me down, so I got kidded a lot, you know, in probably in the in the sixth, seventh grade, someone says, Okay, you have your brother's shirt on, and they kind of made a little joke about it. So at that point I said, Let me create me a job. So I started cleaning the house, washing all the dishes. My daddy was a military guy, so he made sure that the moment that we woke up out of the bed, the first thing we did, we made up our bed and everything was all neat and organized before we actually came in uh, and had our breakfast in the morning. Uh, so from there, after washing the cars, I started throwing the newspaper for the Atlanta Daily World. And uh, I think back then it was like 15, 20 cents the newspaper. And I would get paid five cents per newspaper that I would throw. And I saved up all my money then. And uh, I bought me a lawnmower. And I went back into the same areas where I was. And uh, I purchased the lawnmower and started cutting everybody's grass. So uh, after doing that for about a year and a half, two years, I purchased my first car at 16. So that was um, very rewarding for me. And I hung around a lot of people that was older than me. I never really associated myself with people that was younger than me because I felt that I couldn't learn anything. So I positioned myself to hang around people that was much older than me so I could kind of help advance myself so I wouldn't make a whole lot of mistakes coming up in life. You know, uh, because I got to see the Dr. King and I saw how the um, the young people uh, that was out there uh, protesting in the uh, in Walgreens, as we saw that, uh, where they was pouring the sugar on top of the, the protesters' heads and ketchup and mustard, because they were fighting for us. They were fighting that we would have a better day. And then I saw the riots on the streets, you know, when Dr. King was assassinated. And all the Jewish people in our community was burnt out of our community. All those stores uh, was looted and, and, and burned down. 
And then we had to go through the Vietnam War. You know, that was another thing because my mother was very worried about my other brothers receiving that number. You know, they pulled these certain numbers and that determined whether you were going to go in the infantry as far as uh, the Vietnam War. So my brother uh, got accepted into Atlanta Area Tech. So what the, what one of the rules were, if, if your kids were in college or they was in some kind of technical school, then they would not be drafted. To, be, to become in the military. So my brother, Wendell, after me, unfortunately, my father convinced him to go into the Navy. So he volunteered to go into the Navy. So he ended up on a destroyer. And uh, he did that for like a year. And then he got uh, uh, honorably discharged because he just didn't really uh, like the Navy. He didn't like the fighting of the war. And so when he came back, uh, he he learned about the IBEW, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And uh, so he got into the electrical program. And then after his first year, he was able to recommend me as his younger brother to go into the electrical program. <clears throat> and one thing I learned about uh, going through the IBEW was, you know, white america did not really know us and they did not understand black america and so we entered into the trade jobs and, and one of the uh the tests as you would call was to teach us to see if we were mechanically inclined so they had these little pegs on the table where you had to put a star here you had to put a square right here you had to put a circle right here these are kids games and so you know they want to see how fast you could do it so you Put the pegs in, you put the star in very, very fast. Then they say, okay, so he's mechanically inclined. He understands this part. So I think for them overcoming that we could think just as good as they could. And um, then they start accepting us. And after about three years in the IBW, then I met the Grand Dragon, the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, that was uh, really something that was disturbing uh, because I went to an all-black school, and then when I went to the IBW, it was an all-white school. So attending the IBW, the all-white school, uh, it wasn't that many African Americans in the class. But you know, walking on the construction sites was probably the most rewarding thing in the world because all of the laborers that were there was black. So you know, all of your people that was the uh, carrying the uh, doing with the mortar or setting up the bricks or sweeping the buildings or setting up the scaffolding or just doing any type of hard labor was African Americans. So here this new generation come in in 75 that were African Americans and now we're carrying tool belts and a tool pouch and you can see the pride on their face to see that the world was actually changing for the better. So we started entering into the trade jobs and becoming the new electricians, the new plumbers, the new carpenters. So we had that for like three generations of us learning these trade jobs. Because my father used to always say, if you learn a trade job, then the sky is the limit, that no one can hold you back. If you go to college, you're going to end up working for white America and you're going to run into a glass ceiling. So he was very proud to see his two younger sons going into the trade jobs because it taught us business. It taught us finance. It taught us how to operate our money, all the different things in the trade jobs. So I was actually one of the first African-Americans at 101 Marietta Street. I did South Training Center. Uh, and then I did the Marriott Marquis. Now, when I heard a minister in 85 uh, that had a profound message and it was called Power at Last, uh, it was actually Minister Louis Farrakhan. And his message was that there was a people that was in bondage for 430 years. And he was trying to reference those people with us as African-Americans. So if the Bible was written that prophecy that we were the chosen people, then I quit my job the very next day and stepped out in faith because I was a strong believer in God. My mother had us going to, she was a seven day Adventist. 
my father was a Baptist. So we went to church on Saturday, went to church on Sundays, and then I had Bible study on Wednesday. So my mother was a very, very spiritual woman. And learning these trade jobs uh, allowed me and my brother to start doing side jobs. So we did uh, Bunkies, Wild Cherry, uh, Cisco's, and all these were on Camerton Road when Mr. Bees was out. So we wired up all these facilities. And after I heard Minister Louis Farrakhan, I started my own business. I took seven kids out of high school that was not college bound. And I took those seven kids that were not college bound and I started teaching them the electrical programs from the books that I had learned from the IBEW. Now you gotta remember when I met this Klansman, I did ask him, said, what are you gonna do that you gotta take this white hood off your head? He said, we're gonna become police officers and we're gonna become politicians. And we're gonna start dictating legislation to keep you down. So I started seeing a lot of the companies like the uh, Ford Motor, Motor Companies and all these companies that was employing African-Americans start moving the jobs overseas in different places like that. So a lot of African-Americans became unemployed and then the drugs started infesting our communities. So I'm witnessing all this stuff. So I took these seven kids out of high school. We started wiring up half the houses in Southwest Atlanta because we were uh, doing our own construction. We were building houses in our community. We were providing goods and services for our community at that point in time. So I worked with a lot of people like Mr. N.H. Brunner, who was one of my mentors, uh, Mr. A.J. Russell, who was one of my mentors. And, you know, from, from going into that area, uh, Mr. Brunner used to always tell me he said, Maceo, do everything you possibly can to try to spend as much money with your race as you possibly can. So he had a fire damage building that was up on uh, Gordon Street, which the name changed to Ralph David Abernathy and, and, uh, and, and, and Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. It sat right on the corner. So I went up there one day and prayed. And then I met with Mr. Brunner and me and my wife, and we met with him probably about 20, 30 times. And it kept explaining to him my business plan. And so Mr. Bronner stepped out in faith and wrote me a check for $120,000 to build a fire damage building. And I told him that I knew people that was in the trade industry that was African-American. Because what he mentioned to me was said, I want to make sure if I give you this check that you spend at least 90% of the money with African-Americans. And I said, Mr. Brunner, well, that would not be a problem. So started my business out of my home. Like I mentioned, I had seven kids out of high school. I sold my Cadillac and I bought a pickup truck. So I turned my living room into a conference room. I turned my dining room into a scheduling room. I turned one of my bedrooms into one of my offices. I took my back porch and turned it into a storeroom. I took my garage in the back of my home and turned it into a classroom. So I started teaching all of these kids the trade jobs that I learned at the IBEW. And some of them went on and started their own business. But we started wiring up half the houses in Southwest Atlanta. And in less than six years, uh, we propelled. And then Mr. Bronner gave me the loan to build the building on Ralph David Abinette and Martin King. So I stayed there for at least 15 years. We had a contract to where after 10 years, I would own 15 of the business. And after Mr. Bronner passed, uh, Mrs. Bronner agreed to pay me uh, the half of the amount that I had invested in that building. And then that's when I moved to 2820 Road, where I purchased a, a building that was uh, actually abandoned uh, because it used to be a Barranco Pontiac. Then it turned into a Kia dealership. And I purchased that building. And uh, I took my own uh, kids that I had taught the trade jobs, and we started rebuilding the building on Camerton Road. So I left an area that was 20, about uh, 2,800 square feet, and now I'm in a building 30,000 square feet. So God is really good, and he's helped me out a lot to get where I am right now. And uh, through God's faith, after being here for about 
10 years or so, uh, we started my foundation, which is Maceo's Kids. And the acronym for that is Mentoring Aspiring CEO. So I started teaching the kids in the inner city the trade jobs, electrical, plumbing, carpentry, heating and air. And that's how I started reading that. What that Klansman said was correct, that they started dumbing down the kids in the school systems in the low income areas. So when I went to Thero High School and some of these other areas, they were not teaching culinary arts. They were not teaching wood tech. They were not teaching them something that would target that 80% that was not going to college. You know, you got to remember that if you go back and look at our school systems, you would see that 20% of our kids are going to college and 80% not. But when you take out trade jobs out of the school systems, then you have kids that are graduating with no skills. And so when they don't have that skill set, it left them very vulnerable in order to come into the world and actually be a viable uh, uh, a human being, you know, a student for the world. I mean, so, you know, when you look at us now, you see most of the jobs that we're working are the essential businesses. We, we either selling popcorn, peanuts at the football stadium, the basketball stadium, or, or the football stadium, or a lot of us are in the nursing businesses. Uh, we're not doing what the lower income should have been doing, and that working on a lot of these trade jobs and becoming business owners. So if you go back now and look at the construction sites, you will see that the majority of them now are Hispanics and Asians. So the African-Americans that should have had those jobs for three generations that we had those jobs, they should have been working in those jobs right now. So I think that's a big problem that we have here in the city of Atlanta now. And you see the fight that we have with homelessness in the city of Atlanta, because unfortunately what the, uh, the Klansman said, uh, by not teaching us and educating us correctly, a lot of our kids did not get out and be able to have a good job. So to see you sitting where you're sitting, see that you have the entrepreneurship spirit, it touches my heart a lot because we looked up to Dr. Martin Luther King, and you know he was a true role model for us. So I see that spirit now is changing now, in the in what has happened to us, uh, that we are now understanding that it's so important that we try to help one another, and that's just really uh, you know something that's so important to me right now is how do we convince uh, Black America that that the power is in our hand, the right thought may not be in our minds. And by saying that is, we spend $910 billion. Uh, white Americans spend $280-something trillion. The Hispanics spend $970 billion. The Asians spend $510 billion. Now, the Asians are spending $509 billion with each other. So they're spending 99% of their money with each other, where the Hispanics are now spending 360 something billion dollars with each other, almost 15 to 20% of their money with each other. And here we are as African Americans, we're spending less than 10% of our money with each other. We're only spending $136 billion with each other. And we have to get back in tune to say, once we recycle that dollar with each other, we can get each other up. So, that's been one of the things that I've seen. And I said or not, I want to give you a chance to ask some questions. I don't want to keep going, but I can keep going on. You want me to just keep going? Uh, so a while back, you talked about that you were mowing grass and you got a car. What car was that? Uh, my first car was a Pontiac Mustang. Uh, and, and I bought it from my brother, Thomas. Uh, I saved my money because, you know, I worked at night. Uh, when I was in high school and uh, I worked as a, a, a seafood assistant and a, a bus boy. So I washed pots and pans and that's how the money I first car. And, uh, and kept putting the money into the bank. And then I purchased my first house at 21. So uh, after that, um, 
you know, I started making one money with IBW and I bought, I bought a Cadillac. And, uh, you know, that's when I start seeing uh, a little bit different life. And, and like I said, when I met the minister, I sold that and bought me a pickup truck. And then I started buying a fleet of trucks. Now, the way I did that was I used three credit cards. Credit was so good because, you know, a lot of African-Americans, once they get out of school and graduate from high school, then the credit card companies would flood you with applications. They wanted you to apply for credit cards. And they knew that if you applied for these credit cards, you would probably misuse the money and you would mess up your credit. But I was I didn't do that. So I took those credit cards and I used them to my advantage and I started my company, a business plan. So how is your company start? Um, how's your company now with COVID? How is my company now with COVID? Uh, really, like I said, because we're in the security business and we're in the essential business, uh, our company never slowed down because we install alarm systems and we install camera systems. We install access control. We do video monitoring. Uh, people need our services to protect their businesses and protect their homes. So because I was started out in the electrical field and in 85 when the economy tanked and I diversified and started system fiber electronics, I got into what is called a recession proof business. And, and we get residual income from all of our customers. So it has not really uh, affected us at all. We make sure all of our uh, drivers are masked up and they all wear gloves to make sure they protect themselves uh, and make sure that the customers feel safe when we enter into their homes. Uh, my office is uh, most of the people uh, different offices, so they wear their mask, really communicate phones, and uh, we can communicate by lunch of this company if we have to do any kind of training or anything like that. Uh, so it has really affected us. Actually, we've got an uptick in business, believe it or not, during the covert. Uh, so I didn't apply for no PPE or anything. I didn't want to get involved with the government giving me any type of funding. Uh, so we've just been really blessed by God. I think my company is really, uh, 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 because of what I do and what I believe in and my faith in God, and most of the people that I hire on, I want to make sure they have some faith in God. But uh, uh, we, we pray here together. Uh, we do a lot of entertainment together. We go to baseball games together. We may all do a football field trip or something. We're like one big family. So, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that COVID has affected more African-Americans than anyone else because of our underlying conditions. You know, like I talked about when I go back into the schools, we're being fed the wrong foods. So when you go to a lot of these inner city schools, you see that we have pizza, pizza and things that we shouldn't be eating because I'm a cancer survivor and I had stage four cancer and the doctor told me it was uncurable. My mother passed away with breast cancer. So that's when I learned about Dr. Baby and I learned that the importance of eating right because I'm a type two diabetic. And I try to make sure that everyone that I come in in contact with, that they understand that it's so important that we eat the right food. Because a lot of the people that are dying, unfortunately, from COVID virus is African-Americans. 33% of the deaths of COVID virus is African-Americans. And it's all because of our nutrition and what we're eating. And uh, I try to explain to people that the Bible says that God says, I've given you all the green leafy things to eat. And that's the fruits and the vegetables that we should be eating. And so I built a garden here, System Fiber Electronics. All the employees are learning a lot about gardening and 
the, and the stuff that we can plant here at this facility. We have apple trees all around this facility. We have peach trees, we have pear trees. And uh, so now I'm teaching nutrition around the uh, operation of my uh, building here because I'm blessed to be alive. You know, one doctor gave me two years to live and, and God, uh, me, I'm, with, I'm still staying. This is, I'm going into my uh, third year right now of being cancer free. As a matter of fact, I went to the doctor today to uh, to get uh, my test and uh, got through bone scan and the scan and I'm cancer free. So I give God thanks for that. But I know that it's in the food that we eat, and and I, and I always try to win the churches and, and when they give me an opportunity to speak, I speak about my journey with cancer and how I was able to overcome a cancer that was called Baraka two and it was an uncurable cancer. And I know that it's in the foods that we eat. So um, I try to spread as much information as I possibly can to everyone out there that is so important that you recognize the foods that you eat and get exercise to keep yourself in shape. So you had to become a vegan. Well, more or less a vegan or Presbyterian. I mean, I, I eat fish, grilled fish, uh, like salmon, or I may eat something like white fish, something like that. My wife may cook that occasionally. But most of all, I cook mostly uh, raw vegetables and, or cooked vegetables. And that's been a part of my lifestyle. Because if you look at our ancestors and you, you, you try to wonder how they live so long with any complications, they were really vegans. Or, or everything they had on the land was uh, free range. So they didn't have all the chemicals in there that you see today. If you see like KFC, you know, that's a, a clone chicken, you know. it's If you research it, it's born without any feathers. So it's easy for them to get it to the plant quickly and then get it to market. So we eat a lot of foods now that has a lot of chemicals inside of it. And we really have to research what we're eating right now. So thank diet is what's kept me here now. I do at least uh, three to four miles, four days a week on a tread machine. I walk, I swim a lot, and um, I only drink alkaline water. Uh, I do a lot of beats, uh, and I do things that are very healthy for me. I only drink the alkaline water. So uh, it's been a blessing that I've been able to, uh, to cure myself or actually come out of this stage for cancer. So now we're kind of in a world to where we see that we're fighting for Black Lives Matter. And as I mentioned to you earlier, you know, that was not new to me because like I mentioned, if, if most of these police officers are Klansmen, then you can see the way we're being treated and, and, and that forefront based on technology because technology has really opened the eyes of America so they can see how bad we're being treated. So I'm just so I see the technology out there now to where white America, because there's a lot of good hearts out there. I got a lot of white friends. I got a lot of Asian friends. I got a lot of, um, uh, Korean friends and, and people that I've met along the way that I do security monitoring for. And there are a lot of good people out there and they see the struggles that we have gone through as, as African Americans. But, you know, there comes a time when we have to say to ourselves that we're our own enemy. And if we're our own enemy, we have to understand how do we fix the problem. And the only way we can fix the problem is we have to recognize how we spend our money. And if we recognize what they did in Black Wall Street, which is one of the things that were not taught in the school system when I came up. No one knew about Black Wall Street when I came up. You know, they, they Hello. taught us something totally different. So, you know, now that we're getting a complete understanding of what really took place, then, you know, 
this go right for your hey. generation that your opportunities are going to become much better. Hello? Are you live? Yes. I'm here, Hello? Hello? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, I was wondering if you could hear me. Uh, sorry, the whole thing just locked up. Okay. So, we're, so you just have to basically eat clean and you, you only had, they, the doctor said you only had two years to live. How did it feel when you heard that? Right, doctor. Thing, a lot of doctors are misdiagnosing a lot of African-Americans. So, you know, we're taking medicine that does us more harm than it does good. So we have to really understand that the body is so smart that it can itself. Feed the body right in order for it a body body has to continue to get to the cure the problems that you may build the good things that you should be eating then the body actually starts curing itself and you can do that by eating the green leafy plants and the things that god put here on the earth for us to eat so you know right now i'm cancer free i've gone through four scans the doctor really can't give me an definitive answer on why I am cancer free. A lot of them don't ask you what you are eating or even make a suggestion because you got to understand it's a billion dollar operation. It may be a trillion dollar operation. And most of the people that are dying on the earth from cancer are African Americans. And it's because we have a poor lifestyle. And when you take things out of the school system, and when you feed a lot of the kids that's in the school system, pizza, pasta, they have soft drink machines in there, Pepsi Cola's in there, Coca Cola's in there. When you're giving these kids at a younger age, then you're setting them up to become diabetics. And once they become diabetics, then their health condition is very. So in these offices, That we're hoping it's going to do the right thing. And this election is really, really so important because I really thought a lot about leaders that we have in the last eight to 10 school system and bring programs in that would help us as African Americans. They didn't recognize that most of the ailments that are in the hospitals now to African Americans is due to our health condition. And if we can feed our kids bad food, then we're going to have a serious problem continuously going forward. As you, I heard you want to start like a. No, um, Atlanta's Nest, the third leading business underneath the silent air is Atkins. So you have to ask yourself, where where is our leadership? How did we end up with so many African Americans homeless now? And it's because of the programs that we took out of the school system. When we took school prayer out of the school system, that was one of the biggest tragedies we could have ever done because we, we took the faith of God out of our system. And we were hoping that that would happen from the home. So if your parents are not training you these things, then you should get them in the school systems. So we'll better you off. Because when my kids foundation, I would bring my kids together and we would pray. Uh, we would do certain things and I would teach them how to pay a water bill, a gas bill, a light bill. And I would do formulas with them to show them if they want to live in a home of this size, how much money do you have to make? If you want to live in the middle income, how much money do you have to make? And I would take them into the rich areas of town that was under construction so they could see something different that would open up their eyes. 
because we are very gifted as African Americans. We are very smart people. We are brilliant people. And we have created so many things for white America that we don't get uh, the royalties of. So we've invented so many different things that people don't even know in our school system that we've invented these different things. So it's, it's so important that we're able to use this creative mind that we have and then try to give back to the community to help the younger generation like yourself. Because your generation is our future. We look at you to make sure that what you're going to do is going to open up more doors for someone coming behind you. I heard you want to start a like green food store around. Um, I heard you want to start a green food store for um people, so they won't be eating so bad. Say that one more time, I didn't hear you. I heard you wanted to open like a natural food store so people won't be eating yes, bad yes, food. That's my next move. Right, and I created another company. And it's, uh, it's a vegan, it's gonna be a vegan restaurant. And we're getting ready to do an extension on to the building here at System 5 Electronics. Like I mentioned, we are 35, uh, 30,000 square feet. We're gonna add another uh, 20,000 square feet to the left of this building. And it's gonna be called a vegan bistro and bar. So uh, we're gonna actually bring in things to the community in the Camerton Road area where people can eat smoothies. And we're gonna actually have classes to teach people how to grow vegetables in the community. And uh, we're going to try to feed you something more natural with a good taste. So then you can actually uh, be able to learn how to cook these foods at home. And uh, you can see the nutritional value. So that's something I'm really excited about, uh, bringing it into the Camerton Road area. And hope we'll start construction on that uh, by the first of the year. We're, we're in the blueprint stage right now. And we're trying to uh, lay everything out and uh, and make sure that we bring in uh, the architect. And then we have to do what is called a phase one, phase two study, where we actually go in and we test the soil and make sure everything meets the standards of the city of Atlanta before we can get our permits together. So uh, I've been visiting this different restaurants that are here and there that provides some type of, of vegan base. Uh, 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 a menu from up for us to choose from. As you notice that um, Burger King tried to come up with the Impossible Burger and, and you saw uh, McDonald's try to use the, uh, the Impossible Burger and it didn't work for McDonald's so they took it off the menu and because uh, you know we still want to eat bad food so you know as a business owner people uh, companies sell what they think the people are going to buy. So it's going to be a hard task to get people to buy into something. But I, I, I'm hoping that my story and uh, how I was able to overcome stage four cancer is going to bring awareness to the community. But it has to start with the younger generation because you could have a healthier lifestyle and live to about 101, 102 without a lot of complication. You got to understand the beginning of life always starts where between one and 23, we're trying to educate ourselves. And between 23 and make it be possible. And after five, we should be enjoying the fruits of our labor. And what happens when we get 50, 55, a lot of us are caught up with so many ailments and we have to go to the hospital. All the money that we saved up, now we're spending it back in medical bills. So we never really get the chance to do that. And the next biggest problem that's in our community is generational wealth. A lot of our kids don't understand that if they work behind uh, any one of their relatives, they can create generational wealth 
for the next generation, the next generation. As you see, Brunner Brothers did that with Mr. Brunner. As you see, H.J. Russell, Mr. Herman Russell, created generational wealth for his family. So they took and went to generation and kept their kids business that they're in. It's very few of us that have been able to get a lot of our kids or our nieces and nephews to buy into what we call generational wealth. Because a lot of us get caught up with white America and then we get a six figure income and then the relative or their uncles or uh, their mother and father that built these businesses, they don't want to go back in there and do that type. And so what happens is they lose those businesses and then it goes back to white America and all of that hard work that they put into is all lost. So we really have to understand the power of the dollar and we really have to understand what generational wealth means. And a lot of us need to learn how to go back. You gotta remember, we had the nail shops when I came up. You can't find any nail shops in the African-American community. You may find one or two, but those nail technicians are making 20, $25 an hour. Now here we are, McDonald's, Wendy's, and Popeye's, we're only making eight, $9 an hour. Now, wouldn't it be better if you made 20, $25 an hour as opposed to eight and $9 an hour? If you learned the trade of how to do nail, wouldn't it be better if we got $20, $30, $40 as opposed to working at Atlanta Braves Stadium and selling popcorn and peanuts and you're probably making no more than $11 or $12 an hour? We're missing out on where the money is. We have to understand what careers should be in. When you learn a trade job, the sky is the limit. My father said, son, when you start your business, no one is going to slow you down. So every year, this company grows and becomes more valuable. It more valuable. Every year it goes up. My company increased in value. And that's what you saw in the Brunner Brother family. That's what you saw in the Russell family. And there are many other African-American families was able to get their kids to buy into generational wealth. And that's something we have to really pay attention to and pay close attention. How do we make sure we bring up our nieces, our nephews, our uh, sons and daughters, and bring them into the businesses that we have built so they can use their creative mind and take it to the next level? That is so important in this day. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So if you could have another business besides the um, vegan business and system five electronics, what would it be? I don't know. My dad used to always say, uh, don't be a jack of all trades and a master of none. So he always said that, you know, if you start something, focus on what you do best. And, and make it as big as you possibly can. Because if you dibble and dabble in too many different things, you'll lose focus of what you already have. So God gives each one of us a gift inside. There's a call it passion for something. So when you have a passion for something to do, then God is going to bless you based on your passion. You got to understand that. The power is inside of you. God is a spirit that's inside of all of us. And when you have a passion to do something, then God is going to make sure that this really grows. He just opens up the windows of heaven. He just pulls you out of blessing that you don't have enough room to receive it. So it's a passion when you're doing something. If you don't like, like what you're doing, that means you're doing the wrong thing. I don't like what you're doing. If you're enjoying what you're doing and it's your passion, then you're going to find that God is going to open up the windows and he's going to make your dreams just really come true. Most successful people always had a passion for doing it. And if you ask any business owner that's very successful, they had a passion for what they're doing. Even as a young man, when I told you I carried the briefcase, I had a passion to be a business owner, but I didn't 
what career I was going to be a business owner in. I had no idea, but I had a compassion that I was going to be a business owner. So if the Bible says, the man thinking, so is he. So if you're thinking about something over and over again, and that's your passion, then God is going to bring it to the forefront and you're going to be very successful. So I don't really know what God has for me now. Uh, I have to wait until that hits me. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, becoming a politician now. Uh, I'm thinking about running for mayor of Atlanta. Uh, that's something that's really uh, because I see so many people suffering in the Atlanta area. And I think that my business can help uh, bring back things and help the newer generation get rid of some of these uh, kids. See their because having a pa they have a passion for wanting to do something. And now they're talking about pulling the board, bottle of waters away from the kids because they didn't give them a trade. If they would have brought in trade jobs for these young kids, then they would be doing something different. But that's where my passion, I think, is leaning toward. And I don't know come January, I will take that decision that I'm going to run for mayor of Atlanta to try to change some of the policies that I know that has held our kids back, our youth back, uh, that's created all this crime in our community. We have a dysfunctional system right now. That's and I have a mayor, I think, with a business sense, they go in there. Uh, and, and, and budget and then that grow uh, and teach program that, that you actually put him to work. You bring him out into the city and let him do his community service by doing something good throughout our community. We we put kids in, in prisons and we lock them up and watch, let them watch and, 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 and just, there's nothing constructive about that. We've got to make sure we do something that's going to help our youth to become better. Because you got to understand, the older generation, we're the shepherds. And the younger generation is the sheep. And the Bible always say that the shepherd leads the sheep. And now that we have lost uh, Congressman John Lewis, we've lost Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, we lost all of these great leaders uh, here in the last six months. Uh, Joseph Laurie, uh, C.T. Vivian, all of these people that have paved the way for African Americans have now gone on. And uh, it's up to them to bring real good leaders to try to help our kids. White America to do stuff that we can do for our kids. You got to think if we're spending right now close to a trillion dollars in black dollars, right now we're spending over a trillion dollars. If we were to recycle that trillion dollars amongst each other, we can have full employment and now we are controlling things inside our communities. We're making our own clothes, we're making our own tennis shoes, we, we have our own barbers, we have our own irrigation companies, we have our landscaping companies, we have plumbers, electricians, carpenters, doctors, scientists, you know, all these brilliant minds that come from African Americans, we can control our dollars to where we can provide for ourselves. And we don't have to go through what we're going through now as far as the struggle. The struggles we're going through it's an economic struggle. It has nothing to do with white America to give us something that we can do for ourselves. As Dr. King said, it's hard to pull up a bootless man. And, you know, when we started out, they said they was going to give us 40 acres, and that didn't happen. So when you have a group of people 
that was uh, did not receive funding, but not allowed to get a lot of loans that they should be able to get. We, the power that we have is the money that we spend. And if we take the money that we spend and say we're going to only buy from we're going to only spend we can solve our problem in less than one year. And what will happen is that community we have a cleaner community. We won't have guns inside of our community because everybody's employed, everybody's working, everybody's learning to provide services for the community. You can be a plumber nowadays. It's going to be very difficult for you to find an African American plumbing company. You're going to be hard for you to find it. Now, these are essential businesses. I'm an essential business. So if, if you take a all the essential businesses out of your community and you that's bad so I product to and buying all the built up that shit for us to we should be making these clothes for ourselves. We should be making our hair care products by ourselves like the brother brothers But brother brothers don't get 100% African buying their products. They're only getting 30% of the people. Hair that look like in our We are queens and kings from out of Africa. Everybody around the world, everywhere I travel, people want to look like us. If you go to Costa Rica or if you go anywhere, you have people over there hanging their pants off their britches because they see Black America doing that. Everything that we do, entertainment-wise, they look at us. Look at Jay-Z and Beyonce and, and all these entertainers, all these basketball players, football players. Everybody want to be like them. But when you look at us from a working standpoint, they're afraid of us because we're out of control. And we have to learn to be able to recycle the dollar and teach all of these trades that you have to have as a homeowner to keep your home together. You don't need to call a pool company to come put a pool in your backyard when an African-American company should be able to do that. You can call a black company to fix your irrigation system when you hire, teach a kid out of high school to have an irrigation company, teach a kid out of, out of high school to have a, a koi pond koi pond down, I, but a lot of people come I in mean, and they come and build koi ponds that, that we don't know how to do. I can't hear you. Well, can you hear me now? Yes. How about now? Yeah, we must teach the jobs that we that is is inside of our communities, the liquor stores, the grocery stores, the convenience stores, the gas, the, all of these stores that are in our community needs to be owned by us. We need to furnish everything that's inside of our community. Most of the people that provide services for us in our communities, they don't live in our communities. They live outside of our communities. If you were to travel, uh, let me give you an example. If you go up Jimmy Carter Boulevard and you get off the exit up there and go to the left, the Indians have their own mall. They have their own shopping center. They have all their own stores where they buy from each other. If you were to go to uh, Spaghetti Junction, uh, you would see where Koreans live. And the Koreans have their own stores where they shop from each other, they buy from each other. They don't buy from us, they buy from each other. Why is it that we don't buy from each other? Fix the problem if each other. No? 
So, so you should become a speaker. Really need to become a speaker, man. I have uh, spoken in at least uh, 12 churches uh, last year before the coronavirus. And I spoke about my childhood journey. And uh, I spoke about my cancer. And I'm in the process of, of writing a book. I'm probably about three quarters of the way into writing my book right now. To kind of kind of paint the picture of what happened to Black America. And how the... Uh, they filtrate all these drugs in our community and how we had crackies and how we had so many mothers having kids uh, or having babies by people uh, that did not want to be the father figure. Uh, right now we're losing family value. And uh, I, I, I believe that that may be my calling is to run for mayor to try to create family value back into the system some kind of way. Because that's that backbone of the community is family value. There's so many young babies by these young girls, three, four of them, but they care less about raising their kid, their kids. And that's one of the biggest tragedies that we have. So we got to change that. And I'm always open to go to anyone to speak. Uh, I was invited to go to Chicago to speak at one of the audience. If you have a church or area where you would like to come and speak, just reach out to me here at System 5 Electronics and uh, call me at 404-756-0736. And I would be more than happy, glad to come and speak uh, to your congregation or speak to your members or speak to your organization. Uh, we've started another group, which is the CE Roundtable. And what we're doing there is we're bringing together business owners and we are collaborating around the round table and we're teaching each other our knowledge. So we've just started that maybe about six months ago and then the coronavirus hit, so we had to stop that. So once this gets passed, we're going to start that back up, uh, the CEO Roundtable to where all black business owners can come together and we can have a dialogue on how we can fix the problem in the black community. Because if we don't get a handle on this thing in the generation of the next six or seven years, Atlanta is really going to be another LA. And, you know, we're going to have so many homeless people sleeping on our bridges. It's going to be really sad. So, you know, a lot of our politicians, I don't think they know how to get a handle on what is happening when they know that it starts from the school system. That's the feeder program. You've got to create the bright minds out of school to make sure they are part of the solution and not a part of the problem. So that is so important that we get back into the school system and we fix the problem so these kids won't come out with a corrupt mentality or, or a thinking process that they feel like uh, there is no American dream. When I came up, that's all I said, that I want to live the American dream. I want to live the American dream. Kids don't say that anymore. Uh, we all wanted to be police officers, doctors, and, and lawyers. Uh, you look at kids now, you ask them the question, they want to be a football player, a basketball player, or a rapper. So the thinking has changed. The narrative has changed. So they don't understand that they have a very creative mind and that they can become whatever you would like to be. But we have to teach these kids in school that not only you can go to college and be successful, but you can learn a trade and even be more successful. The richest people on the in the earth has a trade job. Your most successful people here come from a trade job they learned a trade that's where the money is the money is in the trade jobs look at all these companies that are very wealthy it's a trade 
why are we asking our kids to have a trade job? It's really sad. So the CEO roundtable is going to be coming back, hopefully the first of the year. You can reach out to me there and become a part of the CEO roundtable. So you can sit up and meet all of these uh, CEOs that have done very well, that can share their, their uh, information back with you, their knowledge, because knowledge is power. And if we don't teach one another, we can't help one another. So it's so important. Knowledge is power. And we must give back to our youth. We must take the time out to teach our youth what we know so they can become better because we're all going to leave this earth at some point in time and we leave earth the good lord is going to say what did you do to change the world for your people how did you help your people i believe like lamb uh dark skin which we know Jesus uh, we have some internet problems again hello Well, guys, with um, you have some technical difficulties again, but I need to give a war to Maceo. I need to give a war to him. This was supposed to be 30 minutes. He filled it up beautifully. Told stories. It was incredible. Oh, we have some technical difficulties again. I do not know if he could hear me. Well, it's this time. Thank you for the audience showing up. Thank you for all the likes and hearts. Yes, he was speaking some great stuff. Oh, thank you. Thank you for showing. Uh, we have some technical difficulties. I think we may have to do a part two to this. Uh, this may need to be two full hours, actually. Because he was speaking some great stuff. He should be a speaker. Should be a speaker, but... I think we'll have to end this and... Maybe we can make part two. Hopefully, make a part two. Uh, and a while back, he said his information, his number. So I think we may have to get off. Man, this was the longest 30 minute one I ever had. And man, he filled it up with some great stories, great stuff. I'm going to have to give him. I'm going to have to give him an award after this. I'm definitely going to have to give him an award, but 
thank you guys for showing up to this interview. Hopefully, we can do a part two. And just stay tuned. And thank you for all the wonderful audience members with all those hearts and comments. And just thank you guys. Stay tuned.